Good afternoon, and uh, thank you for having let me, me. Let me short, uh, tell yeah. the people something. Um, the sessions will take 30 minutes. Uh, we will record the sessions. And if you have questions, please use the Q&A window. And Ron will try to, to answer the questions afterwards. And um, a few words about our speakers. We have uh, all over Europe today. So Ron is from Pure Storage in England. And you can start, Ron. Thanks. OK, thank you. Uh, can you see my slides OK, my desktop? Yep. Yeah, and I'm not blocking out with a chat box, am I? Good. OK, uh, welcome and thank you for joining me this session. Uh, database copy management with Ansible. So uh, this is me, uh, Ron Eakins. Uh, I'm a principal solution architect. Uh, as Marcel said, I work for Pure Storage in the office of the CTO. Uh, so Ron at PureStorage.com if you want to get hold of me. Uh, I use Twitter at Ron Eakins and I have an Oracle theme blog at uh, ronekins.com was actually uh, a couple of weeks ago was in the top 50 global Oracle blogs, which was uh, which came as a surprise to myself. Uh, so Oracle Ace Director and I have a GitHub repository and all the code that I'll be sharing and the uh, pieces that support this presentation are uploaded there. OK. So uh, I work for Pure Storage. Uh, this isn't a storage presentation, but if you want to talk about how storage is a key, key component to your Oracle database, uh, please reach out to us and we'll maybe do another session or we'll talk about that in the future. But Pure Storage, uh, seven years in a row, uh, top right corner where you all want to be on the magic quadrant by Gartner. So we're very proud of that. But today's agenda is around infrastructure as a code and Ansible. So we'll introduce infrastructure as a code. Uh, I will show you what you can do with Ansible. Uh, and really, we're going to be focused on full stack automation and how that uh, is applicable to the database. Uh, so database automation. And then I have a little demo at the end and uh, talk through some of the, the steps that we've uh, you've used to uh, create this demo. So what is infrastructure as a code? So infrastructure as a code is simply it's a way of describing your infrastructure as code, letting you deliver more repeatable, reliable solutions. If you can code it, you can make sure that when you deploy a platform, it's consistent, whether that be a development, a test laptop, a shared environment, or a dedicated environment, or production environment. Whatever you do, you really want to be having the same configuration. So that when you test something, it's representative, whatever platform you're working on. We shouldn't have uh, issues and challenges when we deploy something in production due to uh, configuration drift. If we change something in production, it's critical that we take that information and put that back into our development test platforms. So from an infrastructure as a code point of view, you know, we're on automation, what do we need to cover and what do we do well? First, infrastructure, servers, network and storage. We've actually done a pretty good job of this over the last 20 years. And whether that goes back to a a gold copy virtual machine or a, a Linux uh, kickstart file. You know, as DBAs, we've had lots of backup scripts and cloning scripts. Network teams have had uh, files they've uploaded for firewalls, but it's always been done in isolation, in silos. We haven't really communicated. We haven't really done full stack automation. It's only been pockets of automation. Then we think about operating systems, the need to uh, manage packages and configuration and maintenance of that. We've done, done this through change control, configuration control, but this has led to configuration drift. And that's really one of the reasons why sort of the virtual machine gold image doesn't really work because it's okay on day one, day two, it starts drifting and then all your machines are out of step. But it's not just infrastructure and operating systems. You know, applications, binaries uh, that the vendor provides and configuration and code that uh, we localize with, you know, we need to put that under automation. We need to have that under configuration control. But not just applications, data. And uh, databases, binaries, the Oracle Home, and also the data set itself. Uh, when we're doing testing, we want to make sure that we work on good, high quality data. And data is often the missing piece. So we have good automation around the infrastructure, but not always on the data. And this is where copy data management comes in and the automation of that. So 
copy automation, you know, often it's talking about database refreshes and, and clones. And by far, that's you know, the, the most common use case for copy data management tools. However, it's not the only one. You know, database resets, rewinds, point in time recoveries could all be done with uh, copy data management technologies. Database branching, replication are all requirements. We want to make sure that our developers and testers are working on high fidelity, good quality data. Uh, the more representative it is to the production system, the better the outcome, the better the testing. So in the same way, we, we automate our delivery of infrastructure and operating systems, we need to do the same with data. So Ansible, what is Ansible? And how can we use this to provide robust development environments? So simply, Ansible is an automation language. It orchestrates multiple platforms through a single easy to read language, a human readable language, machine readable language. It's an automation engine. So we take an Ansible playbook and we use that to automate operations on one server or many across the whole landscape. So basics, playbooks contain plays, plays contain tasks, tasks called modules, and these can be Ansible provided modules or third party vendor provided modules or homegrown modules and tasks run sequentially. Very structured language, very easy to read. And this is what an Ansible playbook look, could look like. So this is one of my playbooks to do database refreshes. So it uses a format called YAML to describe the state. It can be used to build a complete application environment in one language. So rather than having silos or someone has one for their, their operating system, one has for their database, one has for the application, we can collaborate and generate a playbook which spans the whole infrastructure. We can break out tasks into separate files to assist with reuse. We can use roles to have repeatable reuse of code. So a role could be a role to deploy a web server, a role to deploy a database server, a role to upgrade a database. So we have multiple roles or tasks could be put in a separate file which are repeatable operations that we want to do. Modules are provided by vendors, and there are modules for applications and infrastructure. The, one of the powerful things about Ansible is its use of variables, and variables can be used at different layers. So we have variables defined in our playbooks, and there's a hierarchy to these. We can have them in our files, inventories, passed on the command line, or discovered. So the further down the stack, the, the discovered variables will overwrite the command line ones and inventories, et cetera. If you're interested, YAML, you know, people have to say, what, it, what is YAML? And uh, it comes from like HTML. It's a markup language. And that's what the YAML stands for. Yes, another markup language. However, people take offense to that. Uh, and people say, well, it's not really the same as HTML or, or XML. It doesn't have that same sort of syntax. So YAML ain't a markup language is probably the term most people talk about. So let's have a look at the inventory. What can inventory look like? So an inventory is a, a file. It can be dynamically created in the cloud, or but most times on premises, it's static. So it lists servers, infrastructure, uh, and we have these in groups, and we have them in ranges, and we can customize these. So we can have parent-child relationships here. So here I have a, a group of source database servers, target servers, and and source database service. So I've got two groups and I've got children inside that groups. And I can have a parent group which brings them together. So rather than having to redefine those servers, I have a parent group which includes target and source servers. That's all my database servers. I can have variables assigned to the inventory. So variables for the database user or the environment or key or token information. And that's what I've got there for my server variables and group variables. So have some variables which are defined for an individual component and some which are common, common to all uh, in that group. So here we can see I have Ansible connections and an API version, which so that would be inherited by everything that's in that group. So we talked about managing infrastructure, managing the operating system. So we can do this from Ansible. Here's a bit of code that will update the sysconf settings. So if you read a database, installation guide, there's prerequisites. So we can automate this. So we can make sure that all our platforms are ready to have a database installed. 
don't have to uh, code this. We don't have to revisit machines and make sure that the, the changes have been applied before we get to our database work. So we can have a script and we can deploy this with confidence across all our infrastructure. We can use the inventory to say, deploy on all test servers, all QA servers, or all servers in a geography, all servers in the UK, all servers in Bern, all servers in Switzerland. So you can use the group to control where you deploy playbooks. So here I'm updating the syscontrol comp file using the line file module, which is a standard uh, module in, in Ansible. And then I am rereading the, uh, the values so that they take effect. I'm using the shell module here. So anything that you can do from the command line, you can do through shell. Update the host file. So Oracle, as you probably know, needs the, uh, the database servers to be in this particular format. It can be quite fussy. So we want a fully qualified name in our host file. So we can use our Ansible module to maintain that for us. So here's the host name and the IP address, all maintains fully qualified. So what about packages? So we know that as prerequisites for our environment, we can have those coded in there. So we can use yum to install applications. We can use a package. So I've got a variable here. And rather than having those hard coded uh, and lots of yum statements, I have a set of variables which at runtime will be do yum install packages, which will be either iSCSI initiator, device mapper, target CLI trace route. So we can have a list there of known requirements and have those installed when we run this playbook. We can turn off, so this was enabling iSCSI on the database server. So I can ensure that the iSCSI services are enabled at boot time. So turning that on. So having this here, I'm using the shell module to do CHK config to turn the, uh, that on. I can then use the service module to make sure that it's started. We can very quickly build up very sophisticated playbooks to automate the configuration that we need for our database environments. Enabling services. One of the things I always do on a database service internally, because most of mine aren't uh, internet facing, is disable the firewalls. Uh, set the SE Linux, and we can do that as well. Don't have to go and visit the code. The more times we can take hands off keyboards, the uh, the more times we'll have a reliable platform. Okay, that's great. So we've talked about some of the modules to, to manage the environment. What about the database? So one of the ways I'd always encourage people to start is do what you do today. Take a command that you're familiar with and the output that you're familiar with and use the shell module or the command module to see what that gets like. So here I'm saying PS minus EF grep for the SMON, the Oracle SMON process. You can see the curly brackets. That means that it's, uh, it's a variable substitution there, target DB replaced at runtime. And I can register the output in a variable there called DB check. Ignore errors, true. Sometimes there can be databases. If there isn't a database, that's not a problem. So I can ignore that. So here's my operating system command, and there's my variable substitution. So this will give me a list of all running databases and they will be restored. The, the output will be registered in a variable called DB check. So, Operating system, tick. What about the database? What about the, the file system it requires? So we can use Ansible to mount and unmount file systems. So here we can use the mount command. So we could do this in the shell command. We could do lots of things in the shell command. However, by using Ansible provided modules, it means that it's portable between different flavors of Linux, Unix, whether that be Solaris, HPOX, the Ansible module will uh, sort that for us. So here I'm saying the mount module, as you can say, all of my code, I try to parameterize, make them available. So here I've got a dictionary, which will loop through. So this will mount all of my database volumes. Uh, I've got a source, it's available. So that source could be a file system. It could be a block device, file system type, ext4, xfs, etc. So we can have all of these parameters passed to our mount command at runtime. If we mount it, we also want to unmount it. So You'll see it's the same command. It's the same module, the mount module. The difference is this time I've got state mounted, state unmounted. So very easy to mount something and unmount something through uh, Ansible. Same mount point, same name. To avoid configuration drift, what I like to do is when I run a playbook is to copy up scripts to the target database servers. 
is to make sure that I have got the same version of all my servers. And to do this, I use a copy module. So here I'm saying copy a SQL script. So there's a source file destination for my Ansible and my control machine to a destination. So I copy the file over there, I give it a name and the permissions. So uh, there's 755, so that it's, uh, it's ready to be used on my database server. So there's the source file name and my destination file name. So the destination directory is a parameter. So I can have that tuned to the environment that I want to put it into, and then the file permissions. One feature which I use a lot in my Ansible playbooks is the template. So a template file is allows you to take a file with variables in there, and at runtime, the Ansible engine will replace the variables with actual values. So here I have a, a Jenga2 formatted file. So rename.sql.j2, j2 identifies it being a, a Jenga file. And then I have the uh, source file. And again, like a copy, I have a destination target directory, but the, the destination is rename.sql. So this is going to be a SQL script, which I'm going to create from the, uh, the template. And then the file permissions again. So I have a SQL command here, and uh, it's a bit of an eye chart. But if you can see there, we have variables in my SQL command. So this won't work through SQL Plus. It's not a proper SQL command yet. So the Ansible engine is going to take the Jenga 2 format and it's going to create me a SQL script. So there's my variable substitution target database name, source database name. And when the Jenga engine runs, they all get replaced with the actual values. Line file again, using those to update settings. Interactive scripts, these are often a problem for, uh, for automation. So if you want to install Oracle XE, it expects you to enter the password. So with Oracle XE, XE 18C configure, if you run that interactively, it would say specify password and confirm password. We can do that using an expect script. So here I've got a variable, environmental variable or the pass, and I'm sending that to the script. So this can be run interactively in batch. So provide the Oracle password and then confirm the Oracle password. Example here of creating an Apex directory and untile in the file. So here I'm using the file module to create a path. to a directory. So this is going to create me a, a directory that I can put my Apex code in there. I can then take my image. This is a, an example. It's a zip file here. And I've got a destination, which I've just created. And then it says, if that file hasn't been previously run, it doesn't exist, unzip the files, all run in batch. So we've covered lots of commands here. Uh, as I said, most modern applications and databases have a REST interface, and that's true for the Oracle database. Uh, so some infrastructure doesn't have a, uh, a module that makes it easy to interact with. But if it even doesn't have a module, you may have a REST interface. So we can talk anything that has a REST interface using the URI module. So here I'm using the URI module to talk to ORTS. So for my Ansible playbook, I could manage uh, pluggable databases. So every release of Oracle since 18 has a uh, ORTS support, uh, and it's had more and more features enabled through uh, lifecycle management, PDB lifecycle management. So here you can see that I've got the URI module calling a URL using parameters. So I've got my database server, I've got my ORDS port, I've got my container database name, and then the, uh, the API, which is documented in the Oracle docs to give me databases PDBs, specifying the username, passwords, all as parameters on the URI. Uh, so you can call this, and if my Ansible playbook, I can see my scripts runs through, and it can give me a list of databases and this databases. So here I can make a decision on there's my PDBC and my PDB1, and I can use ORDS to stop and start the database and manage that. Any questions before I move on? Let me see in the Q&A. No questions yet. Okay. Right. Let me uh, share screens. So, okay. 
Has my screen changed? So hopefully you can see my screen has changed and uh, what you should be seeing now is a uh, Chrome session with running something called Ansible AWX. Ansible AWX is a community edition of Ansible Tower. So this is free to use. Uh, it's the uh, developer edition of Ansible Tower. So if you want to have a commercial one uh, and you have a Red Hat support contract, you can speak to Red Hat and they will give you uh, full support for that. So what it provides, it's, it provides a graphical interface to our Ansible playbooks. So before I, uh, let me uh, launch this. Uh, so here I've got a list of playbooks. These are stored in a GitHub repository. So I'll, I'll, talk, I'll launch this and then I'll talk a bit about what it's doing. So let me click this and say, enter database name, Oracle Home and Sys password stored encrypted in the Ansible vault and hit next and then launch that. So this is going to call my playbook. Let's make a bit more screen space there, uh, expand that. Uh, so the code installed in the GitHub repository. Uh, so I periodically pull that back. So what I'm, first of all, I'm doing is I'm connecting to all my database servers on the right-hand side. I've got six virtual machines there. There could be 60, but it could, could be one. It doesn't really matter. But what I'm doing here is I am initially creating all of my scripts dynamically, depending on the prompts. So I rename scripts, a shutdown scripts, startup scripts, and copying those all to the target database servers, all to my development database servers. Copying mount scripts, unmount scripts, uh, creating an ER or, uh, and also then on the target side to make sure the configuration is correct in creating all the audit directory and the dive directories. And we can see those going through. So this is on all the database servers in parallel. You, you can see here, we have the server names. So I say everything is happening in parallel. Uh, but it's going sequentially. It won't move on to the next task until the slowest one's responded. On the right-hand side, we can see our database servers, uh, the database is running, so the SMON process in each of them, and the mount points. Uh, so each one of these is doing its own thing. And we can see here that we have now taken a storage snapshot, and I am now shutting down my databases, and these are all working independently, and all of my databases are down. I have unmounted all my file systems using the Ansible mount module. I'm now going to overwrite the volumes uh, using a, a pure Ansible module. Uh, other, other vendors have uh, the same. Uh, I have then remounted the, uh, the file systems and starting the database up. So let's carry on with that and I'll, I'll go back to my presentation and we'll let that run through. And you can see just before I go that the database has come up with the same name as production. So in a a matter of seconds, I've refreshed all my development databases. We're waiting for server two. It's got a database on there. These are all virtual machines. This one takes a bit longer because it has two or more databases running on that one. But let me go back to my slides. Which way is it? So what did you see? There's my GitHub repository, my Ansible control machine called Z Oracle. I have six virtual machines on the right hand side and uh, I have a shared storage platform, uh, or flash storage platform in the middle, and a production Oracle database server running on Z Oracle 1. So the steps I've taken to automate this is, uh, first, I perform a production database storage snapshot. So uh, this is done at the storage level. Uh, so there's been no impact to production. It's a recoverable crash consistent storage snapshot. Uh, so it hasn't had to stop the database, no additional load in there, no, uh, no configuration changes. I then shut down the target databases and you saw me do that. So I copied over the scripts to do the shutdown and all the database servers got shut down. Once all the databases were down, we then unmounted the volumes. Once all the volumes were unmounted, I then overwrote the volumes through my storage snapshot. So that's a metadata operation. So that's why it was so fast. There was no actual physically copying data. So whether the databases were 10 gig, 100 gig, a terabyte or 10 terabyte, it makes no difference in the time. The only thing that makes a difference in the time is the power of the, uh, the physical or the virtual machines, how much, uh, uh, how long it takes to stop and start a database. So once my volumes are being refreshed, I then remount the volumes and start the database. So we could leave it there. And as you saw on that 
my terminal window, the database comes up with the same name as production, which can be confusing and misleading. So I'd always advise that you rename the development databases. So my scripts use Oracle NID to rename the databases. So first of all, I query the database to find the directory structure, in case there's any, been any new data files added, so I can have them in my rename script. So I use Oracle to create an Oracle uh, rename script. So I rename my database, rename my directories and my data files, fully automated from a single Ansible playbook. Using TMUX to split the screen ups, and then what we've seen is I logged on through a UI. So this example, I've logged on one user, but we've got role base access control. All of this is out of the box configurable in Ansible AWX or Ansible Terra. So I say AWX is free to use, it's a community edition. I then selected my uh, playbook, and I've got playbooks to refresh databases. We can also use our Ansible playbook to refresh a Microsoft environment. Uh, so I've got Microsoft SQL Server database. So I'm using Ansible to call a PowerShell using the WinRM module there. And then we put the prompts and we, we hit next. So the database is going up and going down. I'll rename the directories at the moment. So that's moved on. You can see the other slots down. And we can see that database has just about started up on some of these servers. The database is coming up with my development name. So we're waiting for number two. Uh, and we can see here that it's moved on six, four, five feet. We're waiting for number two. So number two should start. And there's the database started. So in a matter of minutes, I have refreshed all of my development databases with a latest copy of my production database. Let's go back to here. So this is some of the code. So all the codes available in my GitHub repository. Uh, there's an extract there of the readme file. Uh, so it's, it's so mo modern storage platforms, uh, all have uh, REST interfaces and all have the ability to, uh, to orchestrate this. So you should be able to do this on whatever storage platform you're using. I'm, I'm just having to be using a pure platform. Uh, using AWX, what this gives me is the ability to schedule jobs to run them interactively uh, or scheduled. Uh, we can provide runtime parameters. We can have notifications. So I've got notifications, I use Slack. And every time I have a database refreshed, I get a Slack notification. That goes to my desktop, to my watch, to my phone. Uh, and anyone who's in that Slack group, that Slack channel, then gets that notification. So it's a really great way of enabling self-service uh, and not having to phone up people to sell them the databases refresh. Code configuration management is, integra is integrated with Git. So every time I put a, a change in my GitHub repository, that can be uh, made available. Host and dynamic infantry management is also available. So there's the link to my Orca. Uh, Recently, uh, this year, I had a conversation with a customer that said, you know, we love your, uh, your Orca, we love your Ansible playbook, but we use Windows. And I said, well, I don't really uh, see Oracle Windows that often. Uh, you know, and they said, well, you know, what can you do? So I took my Ansible playbook, and because I'm using SQL, uh, using things like Oracle, NID, and SQL Plus, it was quite an easy port to make it to Windows. So all I had to do was change the operating system way windows offlines disks and reload uh, bring them back on so rather than use mount that's a different way of doing that so i did that for windows uh, and that's available so you've got orca for windows if you use that and also i have got a, a powershell script uh, so if you don't want to use ansible you can use this directly in powershell so it's just the the powershell element of of orca so the job was successful. I've had notification come through uh, all the steps. So we created our directories, we updated that, uh, and at the bottom, we will get a timings. So there's the timing. So I can see that most of the time was the Oracle database startup time 163 seconds, change database name 43 seconds. If you've got more powerful virtual machines or physical machines, then they'll take up a lot quicker. But still, Refreshing six databases in parallel, uh, whatever size database in a matter of minutes, uh, I think you would say is quite uh, quite impressive. 
Right, so that's me finished. Uh, I think I'm on time. Uh, any questions? So if they're not, I'd like to say, you know, thank you to the sponsors for their support. So uh, Aero, DBI Services, Tradeware, Travalis, Quest, DB Visit, Edrex, SNX, Irix, Robotron, Switch, and Oracle. Uh, throughout the day, you'll get information about how you can become a member or have everyone sponsor and reach out to the organizers for that. Uh, so please su su uh, support your local user groups. I'm part of the Oracle user group. It's been my pleasure to speak for you today. Uh, please uh, look at the Swiss Oracle user groups website for future events and sign up for those. Uh, if you go to the user group, there's, there's webinars and other events scheduled, but also there is uh, uh, offers and uh, other information there that they would like to get out to you. Hey, thanks a lot, Swan. Perfect timing. There is one question in the chat. How did you automate Oracle NID? Okay. Uh, so I guess the best way is actually to uh, is to show you my code. Uh, so I, if I go here onto Orca, to my repository, if I go to, so here's my script, database clone scripts. Uh, so I've got a module here. So I've broken up to make it easy readable. So it's taking snapshots, shutting the database down. So here I've got one running a script called uh, six, so I go to tasks. So there's my scripts, my startup scripts, shutdown scripts, templates. And I've got a template here for my NID. So here I'll create a bash script. So it's all portable. So you could use this in your own environment. So I source my bash profile, Oracle SID, Oracle Home are all parameters which are provided at runtime. And then I'm gonna say NID target database, this password, which I capture in my Ansible AWX screen, uh, target database name, and then the target directory for the log file. And then my script. Uh, and we go back to the, uh, the script. We'll see that the clone DB2 so there, so I create this template, create an SH script, and then I'm just using the shell module, running that script and putting the output into a log file. And I've got a directory there where it's going to put the output into the target directory. Okay, uh, any more questions? Thank you, Mario. Lovely feedback. Uh, anything, anyone, any else? Uh, no more? Okay. Uh, well, I guess that's me up time. We're on a, a, a pause now, so a break between sessions. So I'll stop sharing and uh, let uh, Marcel take over. Yep, thank you a lot. So we have an hour little break, uh, 12 minutes. The next session will start at three o'clock. And if you would like to see